All right, everybody, welcome back. This is part six of the automated special. John here, joined by Pranav, Kent, and Apostolos yet again. How you gentlemen doing? Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> you sound super perfect. It's great. I'm very convinced. <laughs> well, my machine just rebooted like, I don't know, 500 times, so I'm pretty good. It's, okay. it's ready to rock. So it's not going to it'll, it'll beat the M1 chip for sure. All right. Awesome. Okay. So we have gone through a lot of discussion on planning. We have gone through showing you how to build a solution and why we built it that way. We've gone through deployment and monitoring. But now we must talk about how do we secure this? How do we govern this? And how, how do we nurture these solutions along so that people actually use them? And so I think Pranav is our main speaker for this, so I'll hand it off to you, sir. Thank you very much, John. And I'd like to be the secondary speaker. And again, that's a bad joke. That's OK. <laughs> now, I think the key key thing, as John, we were saying, and we, we sort of talked about in one of our earlier uh, sessions as well, where you know, it's great that now we, you know, did a bunch of planning. We can build all these solutions. But the key question really is like, how do you put the right guardrails in place to scale uh, automation builders, application builders, and sort of scale this adoption across your organization so you can start upskilling uh, your citizen workers, low code developers, pro code developers. I, I think you know, everything that any, anybody that you have. So. Uh, some of the key things that you want to think about from a guardrail perspective, uh, especially from when we secure and govern perspective is, uh, you know, what are your security controls that you've put in place? Uh, like, how are you monitoring the networking aspect on what traffic is going and sort of detecting the anomalies in it? What sort of controls have you put in place from a hardware perspective? Uh, what kind of RBAC policies on which user can access what resource and what data? Uh, how are you auditing the system? Do you have both kinds of auditing, like both proactive and reactive? That means that you can uh, react to events on a certain time. Uh, let's say on a daily basis, you check for anomalies or proactive, that as alerts are happening, you're uh, getting notified and you're doing something about it. Uh, and then sort of what does compliance mean? Uh, and then just leverage like the extensibility APIs that the platform has to offer so that you can customize all these monitoring and auditing infrastructure to your needs as well. And that's you know the key. It's a, it's a very broad spectrum, so we're not going to cover everything. But the key things are just think about from a broad perspective across Azure, across uh, Power Platform, and then see sort of what is your strategy for implementing this uh, these controls in place. A lot of things you realize just come out of the box. For example, hardware. It's mostly like a SaaS service. A lot of the components are in the cloud, so you so you don't have to worry about a lot of these concerns as well. And then secondly, like you know, once you've enabled a scaled guardrail experience, then how do you nurture your your citizen developers and your pro developers to uh, create a healthy community? And for that, uh, just make sure that you're creating a rich set of community champions. You're running uh, training campaigns. You're leveraging the free training resources that Microsoft has to offer. Um, you can start sending out, uh, you know, hackathons and uh, newsletters, and uh, you can start to leverage uh, the COE toolkit as well, which we talked about a little bit earlier in our in our last uh, episode. That it leverages the extensibility APIs the platform has to provide, just to sort of demonstrate what you can do, and then organizations and then take this forward and customize it for their needs and, and requirements. So. We'll just show up. We'll do the quick uh, sort of rundown of the landscape of things to consider. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list, but sort of gives you a flavor of uh, you know what the platform has to offer. And if you remember, John, we started this uh, saying this is the holistic enterprise journey, and this is sort of what it means, especially from a security and governance perspective, where you have M365 where you define your users and, and groups. And uh, as users and groups are added here, you know they flow through Active Directory, uh, so you can define, you know, your policies over there as well in terms of what uh, access these uh, re these users can have to the Azure environments and the Azure resources. Like for example, devs cannot create resources, but ops 
can create resources and stuff. So you can start to have those uh, roles defined. And also from a power platform perspective, what you can also do is those uh, roles and policies sort of flow through the system as well. So in this dev environment, you're seeing that only the RPA developers can access it and then nobody else. So only this group can sort of access it. And I can make it sort of dynamic as new employees enter. I can, they can add, get added to this group get a license assigned, and then those, they can start sort of developing very quickly. And I can share getting started templates and flows as well. Uh, that'll show up in the shared uh, aspect. You can also define uh, data policies on you know what connectors uh, can be used. So here you can restrict and say, uh, maybe sensitive connectors can only be used in sensitive environments, like SAP connector cannot be used in the default environment, for example. So you can start to define those policies across the environments as, as an admin uh, as well. And then further sort of building upon uh, to our uh, story, you know, we talked about sort of resource level protection over here. We can sort of take it a step further and then <clears throat> uh, once the environment is created, like what access do all these uh, users have? Like who can create a flow, who can delete a flow? So people can be environment makers or environment admins. Uh, so you can further restrict sort of that access as well. And then you can further go down to the data level as well on who can access this, this uh, data was table. Um, and you can even further go down and say within the table who can access this field or column. So you can have field level security as well. And then you can go even further down and then all the data is sort of pr protected at rest and is also protected in transit. And so this tag sort of gives you a uh, like full end-to-end -end encryption with a highly sort of fine-grained RBAC model that you can customize to your needs. And again, depending on where you are, you can go, uh, you know, complete full depth across the space, or you can stay at a little high level. And the platform does provide all of these capabilities out of the box uh, uh, for you. Uh, sort of building on to it, <clears throat> uh, what we also do is from a Central perspective, we integrate with the Office 365 security and compliance as well, because all these, you know, are, are Office users as well. So you can start from an IT perspective to have these centralized policies on information protection, on compliance, on threat management. And now you can have like a centralized view of the user. So irrespective of whether that user account is running a bot or checking emails, you can have these policies defined to centrally audit and govern as well. And one example of an auditing scenario is uh, keeping track of what flows were created, deleted, updated, who changed the owner and stuff. And so you can start as an admin, start to you know tap into these uh, into these logs as well. And the good thing is that all these are exposed to APIs, so you can build customized reports out of it. Like one of the customers, for example, wrote a flow that used to check what was the deletion rate. Uh, for each user on a single day. And if there were more than 50 deletes per user, then they used to raise a flag and send an email to the admin uh, as well. And so this is a way of uh, doing uh, sort of uh, reactive uh, based uh, auditing. Uh, you can also do proactive based ordering, uh, auditing as well. So what I'm showing you over here is like we have templates that we ship in Power Automate that connect with uh, like cloud access security or Microsoft cloud access security, Microsoft ATP, Microsoft endpoint protection, where they let you manage your apps as well. So for example, you can detect anomalies that on the attended, unattended bots, if uh, there was an anomaly like uh, multiple un unsuccessful logins happen, or there was anomalies in the traffic or in the IPs being the written out, the data being written out to, then you can raise a flag and then you can isolate the machine or you can remove it from the gateway because the gateway has partial commands that you can use. So these are some proactive ways that you can monitor the platform. And largely so to bring it bring it home, uh, you know, we, we just talked about the CA toolkit as a way to govern and nurture across the entire organization. So this gives you a view across all the environments, across your apps and your chatbots and your cloud flows and your desktop flows. Uh, you have flow archivals, you have approvals. Uh, so it, this comes with a rich set of uh, capabilities, uh, leveraging the APIs that we have. You can track by departments. Uh, you can track what was created, what's running and what's run, not running. Uh, and then you can sort of use this as a nurture campaign as well to see who are your new makers, or send them emails. 
if they're if they've developed a few flows and then emails on how to optimize the flows uh, like for example you can send them the some of the best practices if there's certain developers like here's how you can work with your pro developers to create your devops pipelines and stuff so you can start to upskill you know as part of your uh, this nurture campaign and stuff so you know you're sort of coming back to it like you know the this is a sort of a very very broad curve that you can go as an organization and the idea is you know once you've built automation you can use these controls to put these guardrails at scale and also put the nurture in your program in play and define what is your CO strategy to nurture uh, your your citizen developers itself so that's the sort of you know completing our holistic automation journey and bringing the heat home I guess <laughs> yeah it's been that's quite a quite a journey we've been on and and I love it I like that you brought it back to the heat I was going to do that myself and make a comment about the heat so nice work Nice work, Pranav. I'm actually going to ask Kent. Hey, Kent, I would, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, do me a favor. Give us just a, a 30 second to one minute wrap up, you know, the conclusion of this all. What should people really be focusing on and taking away from this training? What was what was our idea in, in putting this on? I think the, the big idea here is just to prove how rich the capabilities are. I think sometimes we get hung up on some of the micro features and we don't take a step back and take stock of what of all of the capabilities that are available here. And I think that's what's been really great about this specific content is that we can see both the breadth and the depth of the capabilities that are available as well. I think the other key feature or key point I would make is just the nature of the extensibility of all of this, right? There's not one organization that's going to have the same requirements as every other organization on the planet, right? And so that's why it's really important to have this modular approach in order to deliver this governance and this ability to nurture and onboard and get people to do more. And I think that's what's super important here is you might have different technology, you might have different requirements, but the point is all of the tools are here in order to piece that together. And I think that's Part of the reason why we, we have the COE starter kit, because it's completely extensible. Use whatever you want, extend it, enrich it, bring new data sets into it, and basically sort of aggregate all of those different data sources to, to get the, the information that you need. And so uh, we've come a long way from a Microsoft perspective in this area, and uh, you know there's more coming. So stay tuned, and uh, you know we're not done here by any means. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, let me give a big thanks to all of our presenters. Kent, Apostolos, Pranav, thank you so much for putting together this content, for presenting it today, for making it fun and a great conversation. I think it's going to be a great value for our customers, so thank you. And thank you to our wonderful, gracious host, Mr. John. Exactly. Thank you, John. My pleasure, my pleasure. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun. I like hanging out with you guys. And uh, to all of our friends at home who are watching, thank you so much for joining us through six parts. Hopefully this enriches your journey, gives you some new possibilities, and allows you to empower more people to do the work. Uh, go ahead and check the description. We'll have a bunch of links down there for helpful items that we've mentioned throughout the series. Uh, also, go ahead and click like on each of the videos. Go ahead and get subscribed to the channel so that you don't miss any more excellent content like this coming at you every single week. And with that, we will leave you. Thank you so much for being with us. It's been a joy. Take care, everybody.